Good afternoon. Um, this is Sai Tarigadapa. Uh, Andy Bono. Tiaga Manion. We are from Capital One, uh, the credit card company. Um, today we'll talk about um, some introduction to Capital One and our journey to be a technology company and some of the work we are doing with microservices, uh, machine learning, and leveraging Akka and Kafka. Um, so I'll start first, and Tiaga will join, talk about specifically the microservices problem. Then Andy finally will uh, talk, uh, d dig deeper into some of the demo we built specifically uh, for this particular uh, event. All right. Um, First, uh, Capital One, um, at a glance, we, we are a bank, uh, and we are uh, definitely among the top 10 banks in USA, and we also operate in Canada. So how many of you have a Capital One credit card? Okay, that's not a lot. I hope next time we see more of that. Um, so um, we are the third largest uh, credit card company in the um, United States. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, we, are also, we are also operating in UK apart from Canada, and we are the largest direct bank um, in the United States, uh, definitely. Uh, we rely a lot on digital, and in fact, we are reducing our retail footprint because as we become more of a direct bank. Um, we are named to the 100 best companies to work um, in USA by the Fortune magazine, best place to work for LGBT equality and um, received several, several awards. Um, named to be Working Mothers 100 Best Companies list. So a lot, lot of great things happening at uh, Capital One. In terms of uh, the ranking, relative ranking, uh, we are definitely up there, sixth in loans and eighth in uh, deposits. Just taking a look at how we are growing over the last few years, if you look at it, Probably before uh, 2012, we were primarily acquiring other financial institutions. You know, it was HSBC, US Card Portfolio, ING Direct, and a few other things. But after that, we are making a lot of investments in technology. We acquired a company, Adaptive Path, which is primarily a digital design leader based out of San Francisco. Um, they helped us a lot in improving our design capabilities. And subsequently, we acquired Critical Stack that is primarily into building uh, Kubernetes clusters, uh, more centered around information security, and Paribus, which is a startup. And very recently, a Notch, um, Notch, it's a machine learning company based out of Richmond. That kind of shows that as we evolve, as we become more of a direct bank, we are making more investments in technology and acquiring more companies in the technology space. So, um, so some, some journey as part of becoming a technology company, we are highly agile focused. Uh, we recruit a lot of software engineers, so definitely talk to us after this lecture if you are interested in pursuing a career at Capital One. Um, we are going more open source, and we are moving from a lot of our legacy platforms to into the cloud. We, are, we adopted AWS heavily, and we are moving a lot of our monolithic systems into AWS, breaking them into microservices. So today what we are going to talk specifically about is um, how we are leveraging machine learning, um, some insight into how we are um, building several independent microservices to break away from monolithic, and how we are building distributed platforms using Kafka as the streaming platform and finally, how reactive architecture, and specifically Akka, is helping us to put it all together. So that's going to be uh, the conversation today. Um, now, we, we, the particular use case uh, we have, uh, that's primarily in the credit card technology space. It's a monolithic. Um, you know, monolithics are somewhat easier to manage and somewhat easier to maintain, but they slow, slow you down. Um, you know, the agility is affected, particularly when you are becoming a technology company, when you want to change your credit policy or how you communicate to the customer with a monolith, it's very, very difficult. So we heavily adopted to a microservices architecture, 
And now Chaga will talk about the microservices aspect of it, and then Andy will take over. Thanks. Thanks, Sai. The business uh, innovation cycle is so fast that the monolithic applications are unable to keep up. And uh, sometimes the, the products that the business wants to uh, get out to the market are delayed or even they have to abandon because this, uh, the monolithic applications are not able to support it. So what's there? Uh, here comes microservices uh, to the rescue. So how many of you are using microservices or thinking about using microservices? Yeah, that's what I thought, probably, uh, a whole lot. Um, so what defines a microservice? So it's an architecture pattern where you focus on uh, something small. So this is where you, your domain-driven design and your bounded context come into picture. On you have a set of uh, a fine grained services which do a smaller set of things uh, and does that very well. So it's up to you to, to define what those boundaries are. Um, which goes into your microservice. And they also need to be loosely coupled. So these are the uh, ways that you could use is some kind of a lightweight protocols or even streams that you can use to tie your microservices um, together. Um, it's not uh, just uh, uh, good enough to get a service small, but you also need to have uh, your uh, CI CD pipeline uh, that will enable you to uh, deploy these applications at a faster pace. Um, and also, you kind of think of your uh, microservices are as disposable. So your business processes can remain the same, but you may be able to swap out these microservices um, and then add new microservices um, as, the, as you tweak your business process. And also, it helps you to, to scale uh, in a much better uh, way than compared to um, your uh, monolithic applications. So now we have a bunch of microservices. How do you make them work together to fulfill a business process? Again, the, to the right is, is an orchestrator-based pattern that you'd see when people are making a shift from a monolithic application to microservices. It's probably what they may be comfortable with, starting with that, where in a, in a monolith, you pretty much have control of what things are happening. You may have one database that you can go in and find out exactly what's happening, whereas in a microservices-based approach, you may not be able to get that picture relatively easily. So people may start with the picture on the right side of, I'm um, sorry, on the left side, where uh, you may have an orchestrator which calls the, the different services. It's mostly a synchronous call. It blocks, waits for a response coming back, and then makes the, the subsequent calls. And once you get comfortable or you, uh, you move, into, move to the, the right side where you use some kind of an event stream to help uh, uh, your uh, microservices communicate with each other. So you may have seen this picture probably in each of the sessions today, so it may have been etched in your brain. So this is the reactive uh, picture from the reactive manifesto, which has been out there for uh, five years. Um, so reactive application, so you can build your microservices in many different ways. So building it in a reactive way provides a way where you can build these flexible, scalable, high-performing services. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the, the advantage of using a, a reactive uh, application. So what we say when we say it's a responsive, so the application responds in a timely manner. So if there is an error, it gets detected quickly, and then any subsequent actions have to be taken, can be taken quickly by the clients. So the, the error handling becomes very uh, simple with uh, a responsive system. Res resilient, when you say resilient, the system remains responsive even during failures. So even if there are some components that, that fail, your, the integrity of the whole system is not getting compromised. And elastic, so the system remains responsive even during some of the, the workloads that may change. So uh, if uh, you may be able to add resources so, uh, for a peak demand, and then you can spin off those resources when it's not needed. And all of these are tied together using message-driven uh, architecture where it, that provides you the isolation and the um, location transparency. Um, as you've seen from the previous slide, uh, there are benefits with the uh, reactive application. Uh, it's better, uh, it's uh, scalable, it's agile, you'd be able to, to make changes at a fa faster rate. Um, they are extensible, so using a loose coupling between the services, you'd be able to add in new services uh, to, your, uh, to your business process. And the trade-offs are, uh, it's a different mind shift that when you go from a traditional 
way of building your applications to a more like an asynchronous way of building these applications. And it's a little complex, and, but once you get over, uh, it becomes uh, easier to work with the reactive applications. So our specific use case where we built our very first microservice using um, reactive framework using, was using Akka um, last year. And uh, we used Akka, um, which uh, was based out of the actor model. And the actor model has been around for some time. It's, I was looking at it, and it looks like it's been there for more than like four decades. So it's, the, it's been uh, tried and tested out. Um, it uses uh, uh, different actors, which basically encapsulate messages and behavior, and then use messages to, uh, uh, to communicate with each other, providing that loose coupling between the components within your, uh, within your application. And, uh, and then the actors basically work off of the, the mailbox based on their, uh, the rate at which they can process. So this is the specific uh, uh, service that we built um, using Akka. So um, in this process, it is part of a credit card fulfillment process where a person, when it gets approved for a credit card, we need to uh, send them the, the actual plastic, the welcome kit, and some other correspondences. So as part of that, we, there was a good opportunity for us to go check out Akka and see how uh, we could use it with and this microservice and then could be extended for some of our other microservices. So we used uh, what we call a, a saga actor that kind of keeps uh, track of the requests that come into the system. And then we also had other actors that kind of wrap the different uh, APIs that were exposed by the microservices. So we had to call a, a bunch of uh, APIs uh, from different microservices, um, aggregate, some, aggregate the, the responses that are coming back from these uh, uh, microservices and then make some subsequent calls to other downstream uh, systems. So this was a, a good opportunity for our teams to kind of get our feet wet, to understand how ACA works, what is an actor model, and, uh, and then um, this led us to build uh, future microservices which kind of add the, the ACA persistence and then the, the clustering. So I'll turn it to, to Andy to the next part. Cool. Thanks, Tiaga. Um, so what we're going to do next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, specific reactive frameworks, um, continuing what Tiago was talking about with Akka. We'll touch a little bit on Kafka, and then we'll go into the machine learning uh, aspects of it. So there's a bunch of different ways of how you can build reactive applications, and if you look at the landscape, there's you know, different categories. This is in no way you know, a comprehensive list, but what we're showing here is there's at least four kind of categories you can break things into. There's JavaScript libraries, uh, things like Angular, JS, React, Node, um, that support reactive type paradigms. Um, then there's languages that support uh, reactive models and, and functions more natively. Scala, Clojure, uh, Java came out with um, some native reactive functions uh, several versions back. Um, so you can, you can program them natively in, in the language. There's also reactive layers that run on top of the JVM. Uh, this is where you've heard a lot about Akka, and Vertex may be another one that, that you've heard of. And the fourth category are reactive extensions. Um, so Microsoft came out with uh, Rx.net. Um, Netflix, a few, few years later, wanted a Java version of that, created Rx Java, and then these kind of exploded into different, um, different Rx extensions. And one of the cool things with the reactive extensions and the reactive layers is they implement what's called the reactive stream spec, which means all these things are interoperable. So a lot of the times you'll find Rx Java used with Vertex or Akka, and they're really um, aiming to use the strengths of each one together. Uh, in our POC today, we're going to leverage Akka, and we'll walk you through that a little bit more. Kafka, you may have heard of, is a distributed streaming platform. It's very fast. Uh, handles uh, high throughput, LinkedIn, processes billions of messages a day, leverages Zookeeper for clustering, it uses topics as the way for uh, publish and subscribing specific messages. Uh, there's a concept of a consumer group, so consumers would read from a topic, and if there's a, a collection of, uh, or multiple instances of that consumer, they belong to a consumer group, and they're reading from that topic, and Zookeeper will take care of remember, remembering the offset, so the record that it's at. So if one consumer in that con consumer group dies, 
the others will keep processing and then if another one is added, it'll remember where the, the group left off. It's also used for back pressure because of how it can handle the high throughput. Uh, Twitter, I believe, uh, they had a presentation last year where they used it for their fire hose where it would uh, go to the Kafka topic first and then clients would consume off of that as needed. The other important uh, distinction with Kafka from other messaging technologies is it's persistent. You can configure how long messages stay in Kafka. Other technologies like RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ, uh, IBM MQ series, they use destructive reads. So when the client reads the message, it's gone. With Kafka, it, it stays there. You can always go back and, and do a replay of any messages you missed or change your offset to go further back. So that opens up additional possibilities. When you're designing with it, you want to understand if uh, order of messages is important um, because Kafka will guarantee that within a partition but not across partitions. So if order is important and you're using multiple partitions, you'd want to have your clients be able to handle resequencing and, and reestablishing the order. Moving on to machine learning, it's really a form of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has been around for quite a while, since the 1950s. It started out as expert systems, which is really if-then type logic. Then in the 1980s, we started to see some of the early forms of machine learning come out as uh, neural networks. Uh, we even saw them in Hollywood uh, in some movies. Has anybody seen the movie Short Circuit? Okay, not a lot of hands, but you may remember Johnny Five is there, he's a military robot, and there's a scene where he takes, I think it's the English dictionary, reads it in a matter of 30 seconds, and then he, he literally knows the entire, uh, entire language. So that's, in a way, kind of similar to what machine learning is. You're training an algorithm over a data set, um, and it's figuring out ways to predict uh, the target that you're trying to, to establish. Some of the, in the more recent decade, shifts in machine learning. We've seen the tooling move from commercial software to more open source. And the other big shift is <clears throat> the mode of deployment is uh, more performant. You don't have to recode it into another language or worry about it not performing. Uh, a lot of the packages now that are open source will produce a, a model that you can run in, in production. And then the latest trend is with deep learning. That's where it's mimicking uh, the human brain, uh, image recognition, you know, we see it in, in uh, self-driving cars, so a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening in that space. In terms of different classes of machine learning, if you, at a very high level, broke it into two classes, there's more classes in between these two, but you can think of it as supervised and unsupervised classes. Supervised is where you label the data and you're telling the algorithm the, the target that you're trying to predict. Um, so you would have a data set with the previous value of, of what the, the thing is you're trying to predict and, and the algorithm will run on it and then try to figure out the um, relationships to get to that, that target. Unsupervised is where you, you don't provide a target and the algorithm will figure out how to classify and categorize the data and predict it on its own. One of the open source machine learning uh, platforms you can leverage is H2O. It's an Apache based and it's one we'll demo here in our, our POC. It was created in 2011, it was written in Java. Um, you can call it with a number of APIs in different languages. Um, supports both supervised and unsupervised learning. And there's a host of algorithms you can use. Uh, Random Forest, Gradient Boosting Machine, and a bunch of others. One of the cool things about H2O is after you build your model, it'll automatically deploy it. As a Java Pojo, uh, you can take and embed in your microservice. You can also deploy it in a model object optimized format if your Pojo is, uh, I think, past the, the one gig limit. Um, also, if you needed a little more um, higher performance, that's an option there as well. So thinking about different patterns of how you, you can integrate H2O with machine learning and reactive uh, microservices, there are at least two patterns that we thought of. There's obviously more than that, but <clears throat> The one on the left shows you an actor system that has actors uh, that are sending messages to each other, but they're also published and subscribing to Kafka. Then on the other side of Kafka, you have a non-ACA microservice, it might be a Java microservice or Node.js microservice. And what this is doing is, sh is showing you a bit of a hybrid where you're leveraging the inbuilt ACA messaging 
mechanism along with Kafka to speak to kind of external services outside of your, your ACA actor system. The one on the right uh, shows you a more comprehensive or uh, kind of encapsulated view where all of your services are within an actor system and you leverage Kafka to talk to either other actor systems or other services. What we're gonna show you today is a demo of the first one. Um, and what it is, it's a, a POC that uses machine learning to predict if credit card transactions are fraudulent or not fraudulent. And what we did, we took an existing ACA application that we had that was running uh, the Play Framework uh, Lagome, which wrapped Kafka and made it pretty easy to interact with Kafka. Um, and also used Akka Persistence and Cassandra. And what we did is we added in a uh, couple of Akka actors, um, a Saga actor that will take care of submitting commands uh, to other microservices and, and consuming and uh, producing from Kafka. And then we embedded the H2O model inside a run model uh, microservice. You see on the right there. There's also an external Java microservice that's calculating features. Uh, these features are the input into the H2O model. Um, so we'll, we'll walk you through, through this in some more detail. Um, so a high level flow of the POC, we have a, a Kafka producer that's just simulating the first message on the Kafka topic. In this case, it's the card.transaction topic. And what it does is it submits a, an event called calc features. Um, the Saga actor reads that from Kafka, but doesn't do anything because it's not pre-programmed to react to that. However, the Java Calc Features microservice is pre-programmed to react to that. It reacts to that and publishes uh, an event back that says features calculated, and it calculates uh, about 28 features. Um, the Saga actor reads that message off of Kafka, realizes that, hey, that's one that I care about, I need to do something, and then sends a message over to the process app actor on the far right, which is the one that has the embedded H2O model. That model reads that, parses the, the 28 uh, variables, and then uh, sends an event back that says if the transaction was okay or if it was fraudulent. Um, for this POC, we used a open source data set off of Kaggle.com. Um, it's where you can go for machine learning data sets. All the data in here is anonymized. There's 28 numerical features. Um, you notice on the far right, there's a class variable. That's your target. So that's what we're trying to predict. Zero indicates that the record is uh, not fraud. One indicates it is fraud. There's also a transaction amount in here and time variable. Um, wasn't a very big data set, about 300,000 rows. So uh, we were able to build it locally in our laptop, but obviously, you want to use as much data as you, as you can when you're working with machine learning, and uh, most likely you wouldn't be able to do it locally. You'd have to use a more of a distributed environment. From an H2O standpoint, we leveraged H2O Flow, which is a, a UI that H2O provides to build the model. Uh, it's very easy to use. You basically just point it to the data set, select the algorithm, um, and it will it'll generate the model for you. Um, you can run it, run it locally again if you're building a or run it against a data set that's not too, too large. A couple things with it, um, you know, here the response column is that, again, that column that you wanna predict, which would be your target. Um, it's important to make sure when you provide the, the training data set and the validation data set that they're two different things. Um, because if it's the same, it's kinda like cheating because you'll be validating the model against the same thing you, um, you developed it against. Um, so those are two, two important things you want to make sure you have. And in this case, we didn't spend a whole lot of time on the data science perspective. We ran a couple algorithms through. Uh, the first one we tried was the gradient boosting machine. And the first graph is the log loss. And you want that to be as close to zero as possible. Uh, in this case, it actually went the other way. So that obviously was not a good algorithm. We then tried distributed random forest. And that's what a log loss graph is supposed to look like. You want it to go down to zero. Um, and it also had a better, at the bottom is a true positive rate of about 90% um, accuracy. So we went with that one. Um, but again, it has H2O supports, I think 10 or 15 different algorithms that you can, you can experiment with and you can tweak the number of trees uh, to get, get it to the level of precision that, that you need. One of the other really neat features with H2O is it'll tell you the significance of your, your variables. 
So again, these 28 features were anonymized, but you can see the first uh, five or eight or so were pretty significant, while the others kind of trailed off. Um, so that'll help you understand uh, your input. And then again, you can deploy the, the model as a POJO. So these were the steps that we did to create, um, uh, create that, that model and, and deploy it as a, a Java POJO. And then you can execute it. And basically we just took it and integrated it into one of our uh, Java microservices that was a consumer producer uh, from Kafka. Um, so what we'll do now, we'll walk you through a live demo. We doing all right on time? All right, I guess we are. All right, so quick walk through. Let's see if this will switch over. I need to go out of presenter mode. Yeah, there we go. All right. So this is that Kafka producer that I mentioned. Um, it sends in a, a very simple uh, command to the Kafka topic that says calculate features. Um, and then walking through our Akka uh, actor system, um, it starts at the application config where we have a uh, play, um, play variable that indicates the correspondence module is the, the key component. So as we go over to the correspondence module, this is what sets up the binding to Kafka and also the, the correspondence uh, implementation class. As we move over to that class, um, one of the important things is it sets a start event command. This is what gets passed to the Saga actor um, as it's instantiated here. Um, so we pass that command uh, to the Saga actor. <clears throat> and then in the Saga actor, under the start event command is where we output some messages from Kafka and then we send the message over to the process app actor. So it uses the tell feature in Akka, which is uh, fire and forget. And the process app actor will receive that message and it first checks to see, hey, is this a message that I care about? Is it, is it one that I'm programmed to react to? So if it's features calculated, it'll then parse out uh, the, the 28 numerical features, put them into a, a row data object, um, sets up some of the uh, H2O parameters there. Uh, this DRF is the, the Java POJO that we created. And then it then executes the model. This is basically the line right here that's executing the model, passing in the, the input and the binomial model prediction um, instance is what will store the output of it. So uh, from the H2O model, p.label is the, the output. So if that's zero, it indicates non-fraud. If, it, if it's one, it indicates fraud. And then there's also a class probability attribute that'll indicate the probability of the label being true or not. Um, so if we go over and start this up. Keep our fingers crossed here. <laughs> uh, so this is our Logone project starting Kafka, starting Cassandra. That is up. We will start our, our Java microservice. All right. So this here is the Java microservice. And we also have our, Kafka, our uh, Lagoon project running. So now I'll go back and run our test, our Kafka producer. So if we go back, we should start to see output come out here. There we go. So there was our calc features command that the Kafka producer put out there. You can see here, this is the output from the calculate features model service where it calculates the 28 variables. Then the process app actor will read that, run the model. There's the P label value of zero. So this is telling us this particular application was not fraudulent. Um, if we run another one through, see if we can get a fraudulent one. 
back here. And getting a persistence error there. All right. So one of the things we're doing in here is randomizing between, um, there we go. So we're randomizing between our fraudulent, non-fraudulent transactions. So in this case, it returned a, a fraudulent transaction as well. So um, that is pretty much our POC. Um, again, there's a bunch of different ways of how you can um, you know, integrate this pattern. This was one we wanted to show you that was a bit of a hybrid um, that shows you a little bit of both of the Kafka interaction and then also um, also the Akka inter-service um, communication. We have some blogs out there if you wanted to go and take a look uh, on these topics as well. And I think that's about it. Do you guys have anything else? No? Okay. Any questions? Any questions? With machine learning? Yeah, this particular one is a, a POC, so it's this exact version is not in production, but there's pieces of it that are are out there. We, um, we uh, specific use cases we can take offline, but uh, we do use Akka um, in basically running several models in parallel um, for scoring the decisioning. Uh, you're welcome to Montreal, by the way. Uh, uh, using machine learning and open source BPM and reactive microservice architecture, your last bullet, can, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about the uh, relationship between open source BPM and, and your microservice architecture and your findings? Sure. Yeah, so that, if you go through that blog, that has uh, pieces of this POC. What's different is it uses, uh, instead of ACA, it uses JBPM. Um, but the difference, if you compared and contrasted that article with what we did here, is that article is really more about human workflow. That's the sweet spot of, of open source BPM. Akka is, is more about you know, handling kind of system type interaction, um, you know, more choreography and, and reactive type, type interactions where um, you, can do, you can do that in a BPM tool, but really its sweet spot is, is human workflow. But actually, we do use open source BPM for uh, the flow downs. Even though we automate everything, a lot of decisioning, but there will be still certain situations where you need human intervention. Uh, basically, that's where it gets created as a case so that someone can work on it. So, and we use, uh, yeah, as I said, you know, we are heavily into open source and we use JBPM for that particular scenario. The main thing is all of these things yeah. can coexist together. So based on your use cases, you could have some parts that could be reactive. There are some that are JBPM, uh, and then microservices using the machine learning modules attached to that. So all of them can coexist together. Yeah, I think that that's a very good point. I think reactive requires a huge uh, mind shift in a developer. The the way we develop, right? We are kind of used to building one call after another synchronously, whereas in the reactive, basically you're listening to an event. Kind of, you know, I think going back to the slide where Chaga showed a message and you are listening to the message. Um, I think the way you want to look at, look at it is uh, when you have a consumer facing application, there are certain things which are real time synchronous that you need to respond back to the consumer. But there are definitely several things in the back end that could happen asynchronously and in parallel and that are heavy resource consuming but you want them to act fast. You know, previously, those things could be working in batch mode, but you want to make it real time. And those, those things could be a good use case for an ACA framework.
And that's, in fact, that's one of the things that we have uh, the example uh, Naka. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, the Java Pojo. Did that is that the whole of the model that's been trained, and how big was that? And also, yeah. how is it deployed? Yeah, um, this particular one wasn't that big because um, if we go back to the number of trees, um, I think there were only like 50 trees or nodes. But if you build one that the, the more trees you have, the more code that's going to get produced, so it'll get larger in size. Um, so that's one of the things where you get to a certain limit, that's where you would switch over to the Mojo format, um, which can handle, I think, Pojo, uh, Pojo size is greater than, than a gig. Uh, but to deploy it, we just added the, the Pojo um, you know, as part of the project. But H2O supports, uh, I think, even Python, right? And, you know, but typically, if you want to execute uh, your model in real time, as a Pojo, it's actually a very great fit. So it, it was a gig, is that we, that, the Pojo was a gigabyte of? of this, particular, it, this one was way under a gig, yeah. Way it under a gig. It wasn't okay. close to it, yeah. I can, uh, uh, okay. I can get you the size. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's megabytes, I think. Megabyte. okay. Yeah. You're not building the actual model, just the outcome of that build, you know, it's basically kind of the rules, that's what goes in there. Right, that, that's the thing that you would run on a server to detect fraud. Exactly right, right. correct. Yes. Yeah.